Welcome to the Deeper Life Bible Study, coming to you from Identity Church in Deltona, Florida. Now let us hear the expounding of the Word of God, a now word for this moment. So grab your Bible, sit back as we delve into the Word of God, and hear the Logos and Rhema Word. Wow, that's a good worship. Ha. Hallelujah. I have um, I've spent some time with the Lord uh, in New York this last week and have been wrestling with some things with him. How many of you know that when you wrestle God, he likes to pin you down? And if you keep wrestling, he'll break your hip. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Jesus, I have no broken bones, but I've been wrestling with God. Uh, I, I can tell you I'm probably going to start a series that I don't know how long I'm going to, um, where I'm going to go with it. Uh, it's just revelation, and God's dealing with, with the core of me and the who I am, where I've been, what I'm doing. And uh, I would title this is How to Become a Traitor. How many want to know how to become a traitor? See, the problem is, is we, if we're not careful, we will think that we were not capable of becoming a traitor, and every one of us is. Years ago, there was an apostle that I opened some doors for him to come into our region and minister. And he, we were in Daytona City Church, and, and he preached a message about the betrayal, how Jezebel betrays, usurps authority and betrays. And he preached this whole thing, and I got under extreme conviction. I'm like, oh, it's me. I'm guilty. I'm a, you know. Thank you. 
Jealousy is the very seedbed for everything else to grow from, if you're not careful. Here's the problem in America. We think we're socialist. Everybody should be equal. And we're not. Anthony, you need to take the echo out of this. Okay. So here's the issue. So I said to the Lord, give me some things. I'm going to wind up probably changing my list as I really dig into it. Because he's first dealing with me. He's dealing with some things in me. And here's what he says. Jealousy. Wounded fear. <laughs> Your wounded fear attached to jealousy will motivate you to be a betrayer. Then I got to this third one. And it's a strength that I have. Lack of vulnerability. Now this is, I've gotten this in the last two weeks. Going back into a region that I have gone and learned and done my thing forever. In New York and I went back into it with an attitude. I didn't want to be there. And I'm jealous of her people that have gone on with her ministry. What the heck's going on here? Are you okay? Okay. <laughs> I'm fading in and out. <laughs> but, but, so I go back into a region and I'm ticked off because I feel like I'm starting over again. And I'm jealous of people that have gone on to bigger and better things. And let's be honest, I'm mad at God. I'm, 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 I'm ticked off and I'm mad at God. I know. We're not allowed to do that. Well, I do. <laughs> that was great, wasn't it? And then shamed-based relationships. These are the things he tells me. Shamed-based relationships. So here's, here's what else I wrote. The final stage is to become a betrayer. You start quenching the spirit. You resist the spirit. You start hardening your heart. You become hard of hearing. You start to call good evil and evil good. This is the one. But lack of friendship with Jesus and making him a task, having him to be a task master mentality is some of the final stages. So I, I, I've been pulling information on how to stop that cycle or correct it or see it. I mean, Come on, we're, 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 we're on this side of the cross. You can fix anything like that, that quick. And so, we, we, we had Oxpen last Sunday night, and I saw some people get vulnerable and get free. And so when it's on my list, I'm like, that can't be on the list. And then he reminds me, well, look at the freedom this person got. I'm like, well, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And then, what was the freedom from? Shame. So I Googled it. You know, Google is anointed. And I found, I'm, I'm going to do something tonight I don't think I've ever done. And we're going to listen to two videotapes. They're called TED Talks. And, and, and there's this lady who is a researcher, and, and, and I'm going to let, I started just to pull the information and preach it like it was mine. The Lord says, why don't you just play the videotape? She's really better at this than you are. And so that's what we're going to do. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to take notes. Uh, the, her first talk title is The Power of Vulnerability. And the second one is listening to shame. 
I want you to take notes because we're going to discuss it afterwards. I, I, I believe this is key to getting our right identities. Okay? All right, I'm going to go see if I can make this work. Listening to shame. All right. If I've done this right, and I know I have. Did you turn the... What? Did you... Huh? Okay, well then turn the PC back on. Okay. And she said, I'm really struggling with how to write about you on the little flyer. And I thought, well, what's the struggle? And she said, well, I saw you speak, and I, 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 I'm going to call you a researcher, I think, but I'm afraid if I call you a researcher, no one will come because they'll think you're boring and irrelevant. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And she said, so, but the thing I liked about your talk is, you know, you're a storyteller, so I think what I'll do is just call you a storyteller. And, of course, the academic, insecure part of me was like, you're going to call me a what? And she said, I'm going to call you a storyteller. And I was like, oh, why not magic pixie? Um, <laughs> I was like, I, I don't, I, I, let me think about this for a second. And so I tried to call deep on my courage. And I thought, you know, I am a storyteller. I'm a qualitative researcher. I collect stories. That's what I do. And maybe stories are just data with a soul, you know, and maybe I'm just a storyteller. So I said, you know what? Why don't you just say I'm a researcher storyteller? And she went, <laughs> there's no such thing. <laughs> so I'm a researcher storyteller. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today. We're talking about expanding perception. And so I want to talk to you and tell some stories about a piece of my research that fundamentally expanded my perception um, and really actually changed the way that I live and love and work and parent. Um, and this is where my story starts. When I was a young researcher, doctoral student, my first year I had a research professor who said to us, here's the thing, if you cannot measure it, it does not exist. And I thought he was just sweet talking to me. I was like, really? And he's like, absolutely. So you have to understand that I have a bachelor's in social work, a master's in social work, and I was getting my PhD in social work. So my entire academic career was surrounded by people who kind of believed in the life's messy, love it, you know, and I'm more the life's messy, clean it up, <laughs> organize it, and put it into a bento box. Um, <laughs> and so to think that I had found my way, to found a career that takes me, you know, really one of the big sayings in, in social work is lean into the discomfort of the work. And I'm like, you know, knock discomfort upside the head and move it over <laughs> and get all A's. That's my, that was my mantra. So I was very excited about this. And so I thought, you know what? This is the career for me. Because I am interested in some messy topics, but I want to be able to make them not messy. I want to understand them. I want to hack into these things that I know are important and lay the code out for everyone to see. So where I started was with connection. Because by the time you're a social worker for 10 years, what you realize is that connection is why we're here. It's what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. This is, this is what it's all about. It doesn't matter whether you talk to people who work in social justice and mental health and abuse and neglect. What we know is that connection, the ability to feel connected, is neurobiologically, that's how we're wired. It's why we're here. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to start with connection. Well, you know that, that situation where you get an evaluation from your boss and she tells you 37 things that you do really awesome and one thing that you can't, you know, an opportunity for growth. <laughs> um, and all you can think about is that opportunity for growth, right? Well, apparently this is the way my work went as well because when you ask people about love, they tell you about heartbreak. When you ask people about belonging, they'll tell you their most excruciating experiences of being excluded. And when you ask people about connection, 
the stories they told me were about disconnection. So very quickly, really about six weeks into this research, I ran into this unnamed thing that absolutely unraveled connection in a way that I didn't understand or had never seen. And so I pulled back out of the research and thought, I need to figure out what this is. And it turned out to be shame. And shame is really easily understood as the fear of disconnection. Is there something about me that if other people know it or see it, that I won't be worthy of connection? The things I can tell you about it, it's universal. We all have it. The only people who don't experience shame have no capacity for human empathy or connection. No one wants to talk about it, and the less you talk about it, the more you have it. What underpinned this shame, this I'm not good enough, which we all know that feeling, I'm not blank enough, I'm not thin enough, rich enough, beautiful enough, smart enough, promoted enough. Um, the thing that underpinned this was excruciating vulnerability. This idea of in order for connection to happen, we have to allow ourselves to be seen really seen. And you know how I feel about vulnerability. I hate vulnerability. And so I thought, this is my chance to beat it back with my measuring stick. I'm going in. I'm going to figure this stuff out. I'm going to spend a year. I'm going to totally deconstruct shame. I'm going to understand how vulnerability works. And I'm going to outsmart it. So I was ready. And I was really excited. As you know, it's not going to turn out well. Um, <laughs> You know this. So I could tell you a lot about shame, but I'd have to borrow everyone else's time. But here's what I can tell you that it boils down to. And this may be one of the most important things that I've ever learned in the decade of doing this research. My one year has turned into six years, thousands of stories, hundreds of long interviews, focus groups. At one point, people were sending me journal pages and sending me their stories, um, thousands of pieces of data. Um, and six years, and I kind of got a handle on it. I kind of understood this is what shame is, this is how it works. I wrote a book, I published a theory, but something was not okay. Um, and what it was is that if I roughly took the people I interviewed and divided them into people who really have a sense of worthiness, that's what this comes down to, a sense of worthiness, they have a strong sense of love and belonging. And folks who struggle for it, and folks who are always wondering if they're good enough. There was only one variable that separated the people who have a strong sense of love and belonging and the people who really struggle for it, and that was the people who have a strong sense of love and belonging believe they're worthy of love and belonging. That's it. They believe they're worthy. And to me, the hard part of the one thing that keeps us out of connection is our fear that we're not worthy of connection was something that personally and professionally I felt like I needed to understand better. So what I did is I took all of the interviews where I saw worthiness, where I saw people living that way, and just looked at those. What do these people have in common? And I have, I have a slight office supply addiction, but that's another talk. Um, so I had a manila notebook, a manila folder, and I had a Sharpie. And I was like, what am I going to call this research? And the first words that came to my mind were wholehearted. These are kind of wholehearted people living from this deep sense of worthiness. So I wrote at the top of the manila folder. And I started looking at the data. In fact, I did it first in this very four, in a four-day very intensive data analysis where I went back, pulled these interviews, pulled the stories, pulled the incidents. What's the, what's the theme? What's the pattern? My husband left town with the kids um, <laughs> because I always go into this kind of Jackson Pollock crazy thing where I'm just like writing and, and going and kind of just in my researcher mode. And so here's what I found. What they had in common was a sense of courage. And I want to separate courage and bravery for you for a minute. Courage, the original definition of courage, when it first came into the English language, it's from the Latin word cur, meaning heart. And the original definition was to tell the story of who you are with your whole heart. And so these folks had, very simply, the courage to be imperfect. They had the compassion 
to be kind to themselves first and then to others because as it turns out, we can't practice compassion with other people if we can't treat ourselves kindly. And the last was they had connection, and this was the hard part, as a result of authenticity. They were willing to let go of who they thought they should be in order to be who they were, which is you have to absolutely do that for connection. The other thing that they had in common was this. They fully embraced vulnerability. They believed that what made them vulnerable made them beautiful. They didn't talk about vulnerability being comfortable, nor did they really talk about it being excruciating, as I had heard earlier in the shame interviewing. They just talked about it being necessary. They talked about the willingness to say, I love you first. The willingness to do something where there are no guarantees. The willingness to breathe through waiting for the doctor to call after your mammogram. The willing to invest in a relationship that may or may not work out. They thought this was fundamental. I personally thought it was betrayal. Um, I could not believe I had pledged allegiance to research. Where our job, you know, the definition of research is to control, control and predict, to study phenomenon for the, reason, for the ex explicit reason to control and predict. And now my very, you know, my mission to control and predict had turned up the answer that the way to live is with vulnerability and to stop controlling and predicting. This led to a little breakdown. <laughs> which actually looked more like this. Um, and it did. It led to a, I call it a breakdown, my therapist calls it a spiritual awakening. <laughs> spiritual awakening sounds better than breakdown, but I assure you it was a breakdown. And I had to put my data away and go find a therapist. Let me tell you something. You know who you are when you call your friends and say, I think I need to see somebody who, do you have any recommendations? Because about five of my friends are like, woo, I wouldn't want to be your therapist. Um, and I was like, what does that mean? And they're like, oh, I'm just saying, you know, like, don't bring your measuring stick. Uh, I was like, okay. So I found a therapist. My first meeting with her, Diana, I brought in my list of the way the wholehearted live. And I sat down and she said, you know, how are you? And I said, I'm great, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. And she said, what's going on? And I said, and this is a therapist who sees therapists because we have to go to those because their BS meters are good. Um, <laughs> and so I said, here's the thing, I'm struggling. And she said, what's the struggle? And I said, well, I have a vulnerability issue and, you know, and I know that vulnerability is kind of the core of shame and fear and our struggle for worthiness, but it appears that it's also the birthplace of joy, of creativity, of belonging, of love, and I, I think I have a problem, and I just, I need some help. And I said, but here's the thing, no family stuff, no childhood shit, I just, I just need some strategies. Thank you. Um, so she goes like this. <laughs> and then I said, it's bad, right? And she said, it's neither good nor bad. <laughs> it just is what it is. And I said, oh my God, this is gonna suck. <laughs> um, and it did and it didn't. Um, and it took about a year. And you know how there are people that like when they realize that vulnerability and tenderness are important, that they kind of surrender and walk into it? A, that's not me. And B, I don't even hang out with people like that. Uh, for me, it was a year-long street fight. It was a slugfest. Vulnerability pushed, I pushed back. I lost. 
um, the fight, but probably won my life back. And so then I went back into the research and spent the next couple of years really trying to understand what they, the wholehearted, um, what the choices they were making and, and what, what, is, what, what are we doing with vulnerability? Why do we struggle with it so much? Am I alone in struggling with vulnerability? No. So this is what I learned. We numb vulnerability. When we're waiting for the call, it was funny, I sent something out on Twitter and on Facebook that says, how would you define vulnerability? What makes you feel vulnerable? And within an hour and a half, I had 150 responses. Because um, I wanted to know, you know, what, what's out there? Having to ask my husband for help because I'm sick and we're newly married. Um, initiating sex with my husband. Initiating sex with my wife. Being turned down. Asking someone out. Waiting for the doctor to call back. Getting laid off. Laying off people. This is the world we live in. We live in a vulnerable world. Um, and one of the ways we deal with it is we numb vulnerability. And I think there's evidence, and it's not the only reason this evidence exists, but I think that there, it's a, a, a huge cause. We are the most in debt, obese, addicted, and medicated adult cohort in US history. The problem is, and I learned this from the research, that you cannot selectively numb emotion. You can't say, here's the bad stuff. Here's vulnerability, here's grief, here's shame, here's fear, here's disappointment. I don't wanna feel these. I'm gonna have a couple of beers and a banana nut muffin. <laughs> I don't wanna feel these. And I know that's, no I know that's knowing laughter. I, I hack into your lives for a living. I know that's, <laughs> God. Um, <laughs> You can't numb those hard feelings without numbing the other affects or emotions. You cannot selectively numb. So when we numb those, we numb joy. We numb gratitude. We numb happiness. And then we are miserable and we are looking for purpose and meaning. And then we feel vulnerable. So then we have a couple of beers and a banana nut muffin. And it becomes this dangerous cycle. Um, one of the things that I think that we need to think about is why and how we numb. And it doesn't just have to be addiction. The other thing we do is we make everything that's uncertain, certain. Religion has gone from a belief in faith and mystery to certainty. I'm right, you're wrong, shut up. That's it. Just certain. The more afraid we are, the more vulnerable we are, the more afraid we are. This is what politics looks like today. There's no discourse anymore. There's no conversation. There's just blame. You know, what blame, you know how blame is described in the research? A way to discharge pain and discomfort. We perfect. If there's anyone who wants their life to look like this, it would be me. But it doesn't work. Because what we do is we take fat from our butts and put it in our cheeks. Which just, I hope in 100 years, people will look back and go, wow. You know. <laughs> um, and we perfect, most dangerously, our children. Let me tell you what we think about children. They're hardwired for struggle when they get here. When you hold those perfect little babies in your hand, our job is not to say, look at her, she's perfect. My job is just to keep her perfect, make sure she makes a tennis team by fifth grade and Yale by seventh grade. <laughs> That's not our job. Our job is to look and say, you know what? You're imperfect and you're wired for struggle, but you are worthy of love and belonging. That's our job. Show me a generation of kids raised like that and we'll end the problems I think that we see today. We pretend that what we do doesn't have an effect on people. We do that in our personal lives. We do that corporate, whether it's a bailout, an oil spill, a recall. We pretend like what we're doing doesn't have a huge impact on other people. I would say to companies, this is not our first rodeo, people. We just need you to be authentic and real and say, we're sorry, we'll fix it. But there's another way, and I'll leave you with this. This is what I have found, to let ourselves be seen, deeply seen, vulnerably seen. 
to love with our whole hearts, even though there's no guarantee. And that's really hard. And I can tell you as a parent, that's excruciatingly difficult. To practice gratitude and joy in those moments of kind of terror when we're wondering, can I love you this much? Can I believe in this as passionately? Can I be this fierce about this? Just to be able to stop and instead of catastrophizing what might happen to say, I'm just so grateful because to feel this vulnerable means I'm alive. And the last, which I think is probably the most important, is to believe that we're enough. Because when we work from a place, I believe, that says, I'm enough, then we stop screaming and start listening. We're kinder and gentler to the people around us and we're kinder and gentler to ourselves. That's all I have. did you think? Hmm? I couldn't say it, but, but I'm telling you, I'm going to be taking that apart. Uh, pain and suffering. So, just take a minute. And she has another talk that's like a year after this one on pain, I mean on, on shame. And then when we get done with that, we'll, we'll take it apart. And I'm, I'm probably going to stick on this subject because, listen, if we can get past through this stuff, we won't become a betrayer. And, you know, <laughs> when I started putting this together, I started putting that scripture with Judas do you realize it's Judas' shame that made him hang himself? <laughs> and we keep hanging ourselves. Um, Brene, um, Brene Brown. So let's listen to this other one, and then, then we'll have some open discussion, okay? I'm going to tell you a little bit about my TEDx Houston talk. I woke up the morning after I gave that talk with the worst vulnerability hangover of my life. And I actually didn't leave my house for about three days. The first time I left was to meet a friend for lunch. And when I walked in, she was already at the table, and I sat down and she said, God, you look like hell. I said, thanks. Um, I feel really, I, I'm, I'm not functioning. And she said, what's going on? And I said, I just told 500 people that I became a researcher to avoid vulnerability and that when being vulnerable emerged from my data as absolutely essential to wholehearted living, I told these 500 people that I had a breakdown. I had a slide that said breakdown. At what point did I think that was a good idea? <laughs> and she said, I saw your talk live streamed. It was, it was not really you. Um, it was a little different than what you usually do, but it was great. And I said, this can't happen. YouTube, they're putting this thing on YouTube, and we're going to be talking about 600, 700 people. And she said, well, I think, you know, it's too late. And I said, let me ask you something. And she said, yeah. And I said, do you remember when we were in college and really wild and kind of dumb? She said, yeah. And I said, remember when we leave a really bad message on our ex-boyfriend's answering machine? <laughs> then we'd have to break into his dorm room and then erase the tape. <laughs> and she goes, uh, no. So, of course, the only thing I could think of to say at that point was, yeah, me neither. Uh, that, 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 yeah, I don't, yeah, me neither. And I, <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, Brene, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why did you bring this up? Have you lost your mind? Your sisters would be perfect for this. So I look back up and she said, are you really going to try to break in 
and steal the video before they put it on YouTube. And I said, I'm just thinking about it a little bit. She said, "You're like the worst vulnerability role model ever." <laughs> and then I looked at her and I said something that at the time felt a little dramatic, but ended up being more prophetic than dramatic. I said, "If 500 turns into a thousand or two thousand, my life is over." <laughs> I had no contingency plan for four million.、Um, <laughs> And my life did end when that happened. And maybe the hardest part about my life ending is that I learned something hard about myself, and that was that as much as I would be frustrated about not being able to get my work out to the world, there was a part of me that was working very hard to engineer staying small, staying right under the radar. But I want to talk about what I've learned. There's two things that I've learned in the last year.、Um, the first is vulnerability is not weakness, and that myth is profoundly dangerous. Let me ask you honestly, and I'll give you this this warning. I'm trained as a therapist, so I can outweigh you uncomfortably.、Um, so if you could just raise your hand, that would be awesome. Um, how many of you, honestly, when you're thinking about doing something vulnerable or saying something vulnerable, think, "God, vulnerability is weakness. This is weakness." How many of you think of vulnerability and weakness synonymously? The majority of people. Now, let me ask you this question: This past week at TED, how many of you, when you saw vulnerability up here, thought it was pure courage? Vulnerability is not weakness. I define vulnerability as emotional risk, exposure, uncertainty. It fuels our daily lives, and I have come to the belief: this is my twelfth year doing this research, that vulnerability is our most accurate measurement of courage. To be vulnerable, to let ourselves be seen, to be honest. One of the weird things that's happened is after the TED explosion,、um, I got a lot of offers to speak all over the country.、Um, everyone from schools and parent meetings to Fortune 500 companies,、um, and so many of the calls went like this: "Hey, Dr. Brown, we loved your TED talk. We'd like you to come in and speak. We'd appreciate it if you wouldn't mention vulnerability or shame." <laughs> What would you like for me to talk about? There's three big answers. This is mostly, to be honest with you, from the business sector: innovation, creativity, and change. <laughs> so let me go on the record and say, vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. <laughs> To create is to make something that has never existed before. There's nothing more vulnerable than that. Adaptability to change is all about vulnerability. The second thing, in addition to really finally understanding the relationship between vulnerability and courage, the second thing I learned is this: we have to talk about shame. And I'm going to be really honest with you. When I became like a vulnerability researcher,、um, and that became the focus because of the TED Talk, and I'm not kidding. That I'll give you an example. About <laughs> three months ago, I was in a sporting goods store buying goggles and shin guards and all the things that parents buy at the sporting goods store. About from a hundred feet away, this is what I hear: "Vulnerability, TED! Vulnerability, TED!" Yeah, I'm a fifth-generation Texan. Our family motto is "lock and load." I am not a natural vulnerability researcher,、um, so I'm like, just keep walking. She's on my six,、um, and then I hear vulnerability, Ted. I turn around, I go, "Hi." 
she's right here. And she said, you're the shame researcher who had the breakdown. <laughs> At this point, parents are like pulling their children close, <laughs> to like look away. Um, And I'm so worn out at this point in my life. I look at her and I actually say, it was a frickin' spiritual awakening. <laughs> and she looks back and does this. I know. <laughs> and she said, we watched your TED Talk in my book club, then we read your book, and we renamed ourselves the Breakdown Babes. <laughs> And she said, our tagline is, we're falling apart and it feels fantastic. <laughs> you can only imagine what it's like for me in a faculty meeting. <sighs> so when I became Vulnerability Ted, like an action figure, <laughs> like Ninja Barbie, but I'm Vulnerability Ted, um, I thought, I'm going to leave that shame stuff behind because I spent six years studying shame before I really started writing and talking about vulnerability. And I thought, thank God, because shame is this horrible topic. No one wants to talk about it. It's the best way to shut people down on an airplane. What do you do? I study shame. Oh. Um, and I see you. you know. uh, <laughs> But in surviving this last year, I was reminded of a cardinal rule. Not a research rule, but a moral imperative from my upbringing. You gotta dance with the one who brung you. And I did not learn about vulnerability and courage and creativity and innovation from studying vulnerability. I learned about these things from studying shame. And so I want to walk you in to shame. Jungian analysts call shame the swampland of the soul. And we're going to walk in, and the purpose is not to walk in and, you know, construct a home and live there. It is to put on some galoshes and walk through and find our way around. Here's why. We heard the most compelling call ever to have a conversation in this country, and I think globally, around race, right? Yes, we heard that. Yes. <laughs> cannot have that conversation without shame. Because you cannot talk about race without talking about privilege. And when people start talking about privilege, they get paralyzed by shame. We heard a brilliant, simple solution to not killing people in surgery, which is have a checklist. You can't fix that problem without addressing shame, because when they teach those folks how to suture, they also teach them how to stitch their self-worth to being all-powerful. And all-powerful folks don't need checklists. And I had to write down the name of this TED fellow so I didn't mess it up here. Mishkin Ingawale. I hope I did right by you. I saw the TED fellows my first day here, and he got up and he explained how he was driven to create some technology to help test for anemia because people were dying unnecessarily. And he said, I saw this need, so you know what I did? I made it. And everybody just burst into applause, and they were like, yes! And he said, and it didn't work. <laughs> and then I made it 32 more times. And then it worked. You know what the big secret about TED is? I can't wait to tell people this. I, I guess I'm doing it right now. Um, <laughs> this is like the failure conference. <laughs> no, it is. You know why this place is amazing? Because very few people here are afraid to fail. And no one that gets on the stage so far that I've seen has not failed. I have failed miserably many times. I don't think the world understands that because of shame. There's a great quote that saved me this past year by Theodore Roosevelt. Um, a lot of people refer to it as the man in the arena quote. And it goes like this. It is not the critic who counts. It is not the man who sits and points out how the doer of deeds could have done things better and how he falls and stumbles. The credit goes to the man in the arena. 
whose face is marred with dust and blood and sweat, but when he's in the arena at best, he wins, and at worst he loses, but when he fails, when he loses, he does so daring greatly. And that's what this conference to me is about. That's what life is about, about daring greatly, about being in the arena. When you walk up to that arena and you put your hand on the door and you think, I'm going in and I'm going to try this, shame is the gremlin who says, uh-uh, you're not good enough. You never finished that MBA. Your wife left you. I know your dad really wasn't in Luxembourg. He was in Sing Sing. I know you, there's things that happened to you growing up. I know you don't think that you're pretty enough or smart enough or talented enough or powerful enough. I know your dad never paid attention even when you made CFO. Shame is that thing. And then if we can quiet it down and walk in and say, I'm going to do this, we look up and the critic that we see pointing and laughing 99% of the time is who? Us. Shame drives two big tapes, never good enough. And if you can talk it out of that one, who do you think you are? The thing to understand about shame is it's not guilt. Shame is a focus on self, guilt is a focus on behavior. Shame is I am bad, guilt is I did something bad. How many of you, if you did something that was hurtful to me, would be willing to say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake? How many of you would be willing to say that? Guilt. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Shame. I'm sorry, I am a mistake. There is a huge difference between shame and guilt. And here's what you need to know. Shame is highly, highly correlated with addiction, depression, violence, aggression, bullying, suicide, eating disorders. And here's what you even need to know more. Guilt, inversely correlated with those things. The ability to hold something we've done or failed to do up against who we want to be is incredibly adaptive. It's uncomfortable, but it's adaptive. The other thing you need to know about shame is it's absolutely organized by gender. If shame washes over me and washes over Chris, it's going to feel the same. Everyone sitting in here knows the warm wash of shame. We're pretty sure that the only people who don't experience shame are people who have no capacity for connection or empathy. Which means, yes, I have a little shame, no, I'm a sociopath. So I would opt for, yes, you have a little shame. <laughs> shame feels the same for men and women, but it's organized by gender. For women, the best example I can give you is Anjali, the commercial. I can put the wash on the line, pack the lunches, hand out the kisses, and be work at five to nine. I can bring home the bacon, fry it up in the pan, and never let you forget you're a man. For women, shame is do it all, do it perfectly, and never let them see you sweat. I don't know how much perfume that commercial sold, but I guarantee you it moved a lot of antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds. <laughs> Shame for women is this web of unattainable, conflicting, competing expectations about who we're supposed to be. And it's a straitjacket. For men, shame is not a bunch of competing, conflicting expectations. Shame is one. Do not be perceived as what? Weak. I did not interview men for the first four years of my study. And it wasn't until a man looked at me one day after a book signing and said, I love what you have to say about shame. I'm curious why you didn't mention men. And I said, I don't study men. And he said, that's convenient. <laughs> and I said, why? And he said, because you say to reach out, tell our story, be vulnerable. But you see those books you just signed for my wife and my three daughters? I said, yeah. They'd rather me die on top of my white horse than watch me fall down. When we reach out and be vulnerable, and don't tell me it's from our, the guys and the coaches and the dads, because the women in my life are harder on me than anyone else. So I started interviewing men and asking questions. 
And what I learned is this: you show me a woman who can actually sit with a man in real vulnerability and fear, I'll show you a woman who's done incredible work. You show me a man who can sit with a woman who's just had it; she can't do it all anymore. And his first response is not, "I unloaded the dishwasher," <laughs> but he really listens, because that's all we need. I'll show you a guy who's done a lot of work. Shame is an epidemic in our culture, and to get out from underneath it, to find our way back to each other, we have to understand how it affects us and how it affects. Nice, thin, modest, and use all available resources for parents. When he asked about men, what do men in this country need to do to conform with male norms? The answers were: always show emotional control, work is first, pursue status, violence. If we're going to find our way back to each other, we have to understand and know empathy, because empathy is the antidote to shame. If you put shame in a petri dish. It needs three things to grow exponentially: secrecy, silence, and judgment. If you put the same amount of shame in a petri dish and douse it with empathy, it can't survive. The two most powerful words when we're in struggle: "Me too." And so I'll leave you with this thought: If we're going to find our way back to each other, vulnerability is going to be that path. And I know it's seductive to stand outside the arena because I think I did it my whole life, and think to myself, "I'm going to go in there and kick some ass when I'm bulletproof and when I'm perfect." And that is seductive. But the truth is, we just want for ourselves and for the people we care about and the people we work with to dare greatly. So thank y'all very much. I really appreciate it. Okay, what do you do with that? I've 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 listened to both of those about five times a piece in the last. Absolutely. Listen, here's what I, here's what I want you to do. Um, go on to TED Talks. Put in her name, and it'll come up. And、uh, I'm going to be listening to. I'm going to take it apart. I believe there's some really, really. It, it's interesting. I found this by、um, Chris Ballatin actually mentioned her on a video or on a podcast four months ago. And then I googled vulnerability and found it. Thank you for tuning in to today's message from Identity Church. To know more about us, go to identitychurch.net. There you'll find resources such as a calendar, media, and upcoming events. You can also download an app for your mobile device from the Apple App Store or Google Play. Then, from your mobile device, you can hear our messages, read from the Bible, take notes, connect with us on social media, and even pay your tithe. Again, thank you for tuning in to Identity Church Deeper Life Bible Study. See you next week.